Good evening to everyone who is joining us for tonight's webinar. I want to thank Nami Helena for collaborating with our task force and providing the technical and financial assistance to make this webinar possible. Joining us tonight for our panel discussion are Dr. Robert Caldwell, psychiatrist and medical director for the Florence Crittenden Recovery Home, Pam Ponich Hunthausen, LCPC therapist, private, pa private practice, working with children and parents for the last 22, 28 years. Kelsey Kyle, RN, care manager, St. Peter's Health Medical Group. Stephanie Morton, program manager, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. And Sherry Walker, survivor. The title of our webinar borrows the hashtag, Moms Are Not Immune from the 2020 Mom Maternal Suicide Awareness Campaign. Many mothers suffer in silence from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, which can lead to tragic consequences. Recent studies have found that deaths by suicide account for almost 20% of postpartum deaths. And another recent study found one in 20 women in the perinatal period experience suicidal thoughts. Yet too often, moms have been left out of the suicide conversation. Why aren't we talking about it is one of the reasons maternal suicide remains a silent issue. Our intention for tonight's webinar is to shed light upon this critical subject and to combat the stigma around mental illness and motherhood. So welcome to everyone. I'm going to begin tonight's conversation with Stephanie Morgan, program manager, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Good evening, Stephanie. Good evening, Dana. And to everyone else that's on. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, please tell us about your work at Healthy Mother, Healthy Babies and your role in writing the brief addressing suicide in the perinatal period. Sure. Um, so I'm the, I serve as the program manager for Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. I've been there for a little over two years now. And um, for those who might not know, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies is a small but mighty um, nonprofit that serves folks statewide. Um, and we work closely with a lot of other family support organizations. So a lot of direct support organizations, including public health departments, hospitals, mental health providers. Um, and our mission is really just to improve improve the outcomes in that prenatal to three age range. And perinatal mental health is one of our areas of focus. Um, and so, yeah. Um, what led me to write the brief on addressing suicide in the perinatal period was really um, doing some deep research and struggling to find um, information and realizing, you know, our state is um, consistently um, has the highest rates of suicide. And this is something that's been a, a focus of many, you know, different grants and campaigns. And I thought it was very odd that I wasn't able to really find much specifically um, about um, maternal suicide in the perinatal period. So um, I started doing some digging around that and um what i learned just felt like it needed to be told and so i just worked out that brief and yeah it was um mostly just to solidify my learning and then be able to show other people and say can you believe this <laughs> so yeah there i am it's an excellent brief um and i would just want to um you wrote in that brief that suicide in the perinatal period is understudied and not well researched. And you talked about that and not well understood. What do you think the reasons are for the lack of research and the lack of understanding on this topic? Um, I, I think one of the first places that we have to start um, is with um, our comfort or ability to um, engage with a difficult topic. Um, there's a saying, what we measure is what we change, you know, what we pay attention to is what we affect. Um, and I think that one of the things about, you know, engaging in, um, research on suicide or suicidal ideation, 
um, it's very difficult to um, see the numbers and also understand the um, the impact behind um, the numbers. So not only are we talking about the topic of suicide, which has a lot of social and cultural and emotional implications um, that vary for many, many different people, but we're also talking about that specifically um, with moms. And when we even narrow that in even more to that perinatal period, which includes um, that pregnancy and then the first year postpartum, really, um, there's a lot of um, misperception or belief, social pressure to think that is one of the happiest times in people's lives. And um, I think that many um, moms can relate to that piece. And I think well, many caregivers can relate to that. And so when you're trying to talk about maternal suicide, um, it becomes very difficult um, to engage in that in those conversations. And so that also plays out in how we collect data or how we don't collect data in more aptly. Um, I think that one of the bigger barriers to actual data collection is that um, in our state, um, suicide, and that's done so by coroners and in many places, um, coroners are maybe not required to have medical training within that. And they also may have social pressures of understanding um, what it looks like to um, rule somebody's death a suicide. Um, we all know um, that hiding things or keeping things private or secret in a very rural place is fairly difficult. Um, and so there are also social pressures on people who are recording that data as well. And that can't be, um, I think that needs to be highlighted as well. So those are some of the ways that this is, it's pretty difficult to um, get a lot of hard data out of this. Okay. And did you find some specific data issues um, that, I mean, you, I think you talked to that, that the social pressure, pressure is the misperceptions of this being a happy time, pregnancy being the most wonderful time mm -hmm. in a woman's life. Were there other issues that you found in your research around um, uh, maternal suicide and our difficulty appreciating it as um, a national issue, a major issue? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think the other very leading data collection issue would be the time frame um, that data is collected and recorded within. So um, uh, to be considered within a, the perinatal period, as I just defined it, is kind of the expanded version of perinatal. There are a lot of different measures in maternal and child health that only look to um, within the first six weeks um, after birth or postpartum. So if um, we're looking at data and trying to figure out, you know, a mom, understanding if a mom has recently given birth, that data is limited to the first six weeks postpartum. So really only that first 42 days. Um, research shows us that the highest um, likelihood of um, suicide being completed by mom in a perinatal period is at nine to 12 months. And so we're completely missing um, that high likelihood area. And so they don't get recorded as associated with a perinatal um, period. And that is a really big limitation, not just for Montana, but for um, all, I would say all of the states in some manner. That is changing, people are doing work to um, change, update some of those data systems. Um, I do think also that there was, um, there was a pregnancy status box that was also added into death certificate recording, um, but um, testing of that in 2017 really revealed that um, death certificates were not reliably filled out all of the time. And, and that was a difficulty as well. Um, yeah. Okay. And one thing I was thinking of, how do you, do you see what role um, uh, drug and alcohol abuse or substance use might play in the role of suicide? Absolutely. Um, so this is a little bit 
of a sticky area, you know, you can't attribute um, all overdose or um, accident, you know, of, with using substances to also suicide. But we do know that in the state of Montana from data that that's a really, um, I think it's 40% of all suicides in the state are, are alcohol involved. Um, so, so a death is a, attributed um, to suicide and then um, yeah, folks review that, whether that's a maternal morbidity mortality review board or other um, review boards in the state and determine that alcohol was um, a part of that or a contributing factor to a suicide. So, I mean, that's a 40% is a pretty, um, pretty big number. Yes, yes. And are there any, I mean, I know you've talked a little bit about Montana. Do you have any other specific data about Montana's, um, what we know about maternal suicide in Montana? Um, yeah, yes, I can say this, and this actually fits within um, larger um, uh, statistics or demographics as well. So while men in Montana are three and a half times more likely to die by suicide, um, women are twice as likely to be admitted to an emergency department with a suicide attempt. Um, that fits into other research, which is showing that um, while suicide is not more common in the perinatal period than outside of that, um, suicidal ideation actually is. Um, and that, you know, that is something that needs to be, you know, attended to. So while we may even just look at um, uh, suicide rates, it's important to also look at the uh, ideation data. Okay. And based on your study, what do you think are the facts about maternal suicide, which are important to our understanding of the topic? Yeah. Um, so knowing that it's one, we're not measuring it very well. Um, and also that we don't uniformly screen for some of the conditions um, that are predictive of um, suicide or suicidal ideation in that perinatal period. And that would include, you know, major depressive disorders. Um, but just knowing that a study of about 10,000 women, this was done in 2013, I believe, um, found that 14% of those screened um, for depression, um, or of those 10,000 women, 14% screen positive for um, depression. And then within that same 10,000, 3.2% expressed suicidal ideation. And so that's, um, that's, a, that's a large number of um, new moms who are experiencing um, these symptoms. Um, it's also just, you know, you'll find studies that say that it is the leading cause, and then you'll find other studies that say it's one of the leading causes of death within that perinatal period. And I think at this point, we're kind of um, splitting hairs. We know it's a much bigger problem than um, uh, what we have previously believed it to be. And um, shedding some light on it is um, a very important next step. Um, yeah. Okay. And do you see any um, opportunities for us um, or challenges in addressing suicide in our state or in our country? You know, where do you think we need to go with this? Um, as I'll start with the challenges and then end with what I see as opportunities. Um, so it, I think a lot of the challenges um, really are about, you know, having consistent screening. And then um, yeah. if we do have folks that are um, screening positive or um, we're seeing symptoms that are concerning, making sure we have strong referral resources or resource and referrals pathways to make sure that People are getting to um, providers that know and understand the um, nuances of um, mental health within that perinatal period. Um, I think some of the other panelists will explain some of those nuances. And um, I, yeah, I think that's one of our biggest challenges. And then also just living in a very rural place. Um, I think probably everybody on here knows that there are limited resources and particularly limited mental health resources. And um, 
whatever we can do in order to improve those, including our crisis response um, efforts. Uh, we'll, we can be intentional about putting um, folks in the perinatal period in those conversations. Um, as far as opportunities, I think some of the opportunities we have is really a, in a very big increase in interest in the perinatal period. Um, folks in our state are learning more and more, um, which is fun to see um, and watch um, screening for mental health disorders um, increase both in prenatal and postnatal uh, care. I think one of the areas where we have a very um, incredible opportunity for growth is the fact that uh, we have a very high rate of well child visits. Um, and moms um, in our state and across the country um, are more likely to take their children to the doctor than to take themselves to the doctor. And there is um, you know, protocol from the American Academy of Pediatrics to screen caregivers, all caregivers um, for depression at well child visits. And um, because we have such a high engagement rate in our state, prior to COVID, um, uh, there's some really great opportunities to expand that kind of uh, screening and care into the pediatric area. And there are many folks who are already doing that. Um, so, and yeah, and then conversations like this. So I see those all as very big opportunities. All right, well, thank you, Stephanie. And um, You're welcome. I will now shift the conversation to Dr. Robert Caldwell psychiatrist and medical director for the Florence Crittenden Recovery Home. So good evening, Dr. Caldwell. Please tell us about the work you're doing now at Florence Crittenden. Um, first of all, standard disclaimer, my opinions are my own and not do not necessarily reflect those of the Florence Crittenden uh, organization, which is a national organization. Um, we have at Florence Crittenden a, I think, eight bed transitional living program, which takes uh, young women, teenagers who are pregnant or parenting with very young children um, who are in sort of unacceptable social situations um, under the custody of CPS or their kids are under the custody of CPS. They're homeless or they're trying to, they're get, trying to get out of a really bad situation. We have a four bed recovery home that um, meets a criteria for a ASAM level 3.1, if you know what that means, but it's residential treatment for substance abuse. I evaluate everyone that comes into the facility. Uh, we have the ability to deal with um, dual diagnosis people that have substance abuse and uh, mental health issues. And I end up, I think, seeing about half the uh, folks on an ongoing basis because of usually some kind of mood disorder. All right. So in your um, work at Florence Crittenden and plus in your work as a psychiatrist um, in the community, tell us briefly about experiences you've had with mothers who are or have been suicidal. Does anything stand out to you? Um, we have uh, worked with people who have suicidality. We attempt to make a safety plan with them. Um, we've uh, transported people for hospitalization where we were unable to make a safety plan that we thought would, would be manageable in the facility itself. Um, I'm thinking of a recent case where a young woman had given birth uh, about two weeks before and her newborn was, had been hospitalized with breathing problems for two weeks. This was the first anniversary that she had sober of a, a stillborn that she'd had several years before and she had bipolar disorder. And I was having a lot of trouble figuring out what was the most important factor in her being feeling suicidal. She was able to ally with us and remain in the facility and ultimately seems to be getting better. Okay, all right. What are the risk factors that which contribute to suicidality in women with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders? 
So th they're the same as the things that contributed to suicidality in, in anybody. Um, first of all, uh, suicidality is one of the core symptoms of a major depressive episode. Um, the other ones being low energy, depressed mood, not enjoying things, sleep out of whack, appetite out of whack, can't concentrate, down on yourself. Um, and that major depressive episodes occur in major depressive disorder, they occur in bipolar disorder, and they occur in postpartum uh, depressions or perinatal depressions, much, many of which are turn out to be bipolar disorder. But, um, and the suicidal thoughts can are just, they're in these clinical or biological depressions are like out of the blue. Um, and the, the Amer great American author, William Styron wrote, wrote in one of his books, um, he's in Europe accepting all these awards for his writing and uh, he, from heads of state up to and including the Pope. And he has a novel that was made into an Academy Award winning film. And he wonders why the heck he's suicidal. He feels like killing himself. Same thing with the, uh, it's very similar to what um, Stephanie mentioned, the, the young mother who is like, I should be really happy. I've got this beautiful child. I've got my family around me. Um, why am I so, why am I suicidal? And it's, it's I'm, there must be something even more wrong with me than I thought. Um, trauma is a risk factor. Trauma teaches people that, that they can't trust anybody, um, that they're not worthwhile. Um, uh, substance abuse, active substance abuse. Um, the abuse of CNS depressants can cause depression. And I often joke that I can make anybody depressed if they'll drink what I tell them to. Um, and acute substance abuse, particularly alcohol abuse, is disinhibiting. So if you were, if you were thinking about suicide, the um, alcohol can push you over the edge. Hopelessness, um, a, a sense of unacceptable or overwhelming loss, you know, having a loss of relationship on top of other losses all at the same time. People who are have a lot of anxiety and agitation and insomnia are at significant risk. And that increases your suicide risk. Um, feeling isolated, uh, cut off from others, feeling alone, um, having a history of suicide attempts, having a family history of completed suicide, got death by suicide, and access to lethal means. So having poisons, guns, um, and re ready access to those things. Those are, those are um, uh, risk factors. Okay, so I wanna just uh, segue back to the role of anxiety in um, suicidality. And do you see that being particularly um, characteristic perhaps of women who are in the perinatal period um, maybe who have given birth, who may have more anxiety and that can trigger more suicidal thoughts? Um, so anxiety is extraordinarily uncomfortable and has been referred to as the, the most uncomfortable bad feeling that we can have. Um, and people just won't want to escape it. They want to go to sleep. They want to get away from it. And that, that can drive people to um, attempt suicide. Okay. Do you, um, well, let's go to what are the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders you see and treat in your work? And do you focus, do you see any um, uh, relationship with the um, hormonal shifts in um, pregnancy, labor, delivery? In the postpartum, um, I I'm seeing um, women that are, you know, ages 14 to 30 ish. Um, the most of the perinatal ones I'm seeing are are 14, 15, 16, 17, and a lot of those people with perinatal 
depression are going to eventually go on to develop bipolar disorder. Many of them have family histories of bipolar disorder. And so um, I, 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 um, for technical reasons, I'm, a little, I'm nervous about giving them antidepressants and we'll talk about that later probably. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Um, the second part of the question was mainly um, the role of hormones um, as a result of pregnancy, labor, delivery, and the postpartum. So I think that there's widespread um, acceptance that hormones play some role and that drops in the, um, there are high levels of progesterone, especially during pregnancy that supports the pregnancy. And um, that precipitous drops in uh, pregnant levels of hormones are maybe a key factor, maybe the, maybe the most important factor in, in precipitating a postpartum depression. One of the drugs, brexanolone, has a hormonal action and to, to, to treat postpartum depression. It has to be given IV in the hospital. But um, so um, there's a lot of research interest in this. The, the only impact on treatment so far has been this this relatively recently redu uh, released medication for, for treatment resistant postpartum depression that is based on the theory that hormones are important. Okay. How do you go about evaluating someone who is suicidal, especially perhaps, I mean, we're talking about women, but how do you go about that evaluation and assessment? So I'm, I'm simultaneously uh, trying to do several things. One is evaluate their risk, um, the, the presence of risk factors that we talked about, the presence of mitigating factors. Um, everyone that, virtually everyone that is suicidal is ambivalent. Part of them wants to die and part of them doesn't. Can you talk to the person, can you talk to the part that doesn't want to die and make a safety plan? Um, is there intent to compete to attempt suicide. Um, can you provide for their safety or do they need to be in the hospital? At the same time, I'm trying to ally with them and validate their feelings and give them support and give them the sense that they're not alone and there's some hope. At the same time, I'm trying to figure out what led to these suicidal thoughts and what can I do about it? Um, can I mobilize their support system? Can I give them some medication? Can I um, uh, make a plan with them? So, you know, I'm doing all those things at once. I'm trying to sort of make, make a diagnosis, which, which guides treatment, of course, and, uh, and at the same time trying to figure out what their actual risk is and what needs to be done now. Okay. And so um, let's just segue in then to the um, medications that you use to treat perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, especially postpartum depression. So if I um, thought that someone had a postpartum depression that was um, part of major depressive disorder, I would be using an antidepressant for my uh, adolescence. One of the risk factors for uh, well, several of the risk factors for bipolar disorder are onset of depression prior to age 23, um, postpartum depressions, family history of uh, bipolar of um, bipolar disorder. Um, psychotic depressions. So they've got several of the risk factors already. And statistically, they're, they have at least a 50-50 chance of going on to develop bipolar disorder. They just haven't had time to have a manic episode yet because they're only 15 or 16. Um, so I use a lot of mood stabilizers. And I, you know, I think some of the child analysts at psychiatrists wouldn't agree with that. But 
it feels to me less risky to use a mood stabilizer such as lamictal or lamotrigine or lithium or quetiapine, Seroquel, than it is to use an antidepressant that if the person has bipolar disorder, it could unmask the a mania or a mixed state, which is even more dangerous than a depression and um, possibly ha and have, have an unknown risk of permanently um, worsening their course of their bipolar illness. Okay, and I wanna just go back to one more thing because I think we haven't touched upon it and I think it's important. What do you think the role of postpartum psychosis plays in, in the risk for um, maternal suicide? Um, people with, um, who are agitated, um, can't sleep, are parent, are frightened, um, feeling cut off and, uh, hounded and having racing thoughts and intractable anxiety are at risk for suicide. So people that are, are um, psychotic, are many of them are gonna be feeling that way. They're gonna, um, it's postpartum psychosis is likely to represent a manic episode or a mixed state. And the mixed states are dangerous because you have the depressed mood of the depressed phase of the illness, but then you have the energy and agitation of the manic phase of the illness and that's a bad combination. Okay, and then the role of the psychotic uh, symptoms, the delusional thinking or the hallucinations, are those also part of that? They certainly can be if the, if the especially if the hallucinations are um, commanding uh, people to, Hurt, harm themselves, or um, if they're persecuting the person and telling them that, that they're, you know, not worthy, or other people would be better off dead without them. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, thank you for your your um, insights tonight and your comments, and I'm going to now turn it over to Sherry Walker, who is a survivor. Good evening, Sherry. Hi. Hi, Dana. So, Sherry, um, as a young mother, as a young mother, you you experienced suicidal ideation. Can you tell us what that was like for you? Sure. So, I didn't actually have a suicide attempt, but I did have two um, very severe suicidal ideation episodes and I really can't remember too many of the details around like the time frame. Um, I know my kids were a little bit older, they weren't newborn, but so the first one, I found myself very distressed and everybody else was in bed asleep and I was standing in front of the medicine cabinet um, knowing that if I took everything in there that it could be all the pain and anxiety and distraughtness could be, it could be done and I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. But I, I was kind of paralyzed there, I just standing there looking at the closed cabinet door and, um, tears just streaming down my face. And I, I stood there for quite a while. And then I finally was able to get myself to bed. And I don't remember, I've been trying over the last week or so to think about how, what happened the next day or how I felt, but I can't, I can't recall that at all. Um, the second time was um, much more dramatic and scary than that for me. Um, and again, I don't remember the, the details leading up to it. I, I do know that I 
um, in the moment I was not getting along with my husband. Um, so that didn't help anything, but I, um, I was feeling really trapped in life. And at, in that moment, I just, I just needed to get away. And so I, I grabbed my keys and I got in the car and I, I left, just uh, had this urgent, really um, rash feeling to, to get away. And we often walked on the path or rode our bikes down by the river and it was a calming place for me. So that's where I headed. And as I was about to turn off the highway um, to park, a dump truck was coming um, in, towards me in the opposite lane. And I had a split second feeling that I could just pull in front of him. It would look like an accident and it would be all over. And I feel like I had to use all my strength to keep my hands on the steering wheel and keep my car going straight and waiting, stopping and waiting for the dump truck to, to go before I turned. And then I, so I, I got into the parking lot and I sat there and rather than going for a walk or anything, I, I was so shaken that I, I just sat there um, kind of almost in a, a zombie state. Um, all, all these thoughts going through my mind, but feeling numb at the same time. And um, I was probably there for at least an hour, maybe longer. It was dark by the time I got home. And I went directly to bed. It was a Friday evening and I stayed in bed um, for the rest of the weekend. I didn't get up except to go to the bathroom until Monday morning. And at some point um, towards the end of Sunday afternoon, I, I made a, a pact with myself that I was gonna go and see my um, provider first thing in the morning or at least get an appointment with her. And I just felt like a lump of lead, but crying the whole weekend. I wanted to pick up the phone that was on my bedside table and call a friend and just be able to, to talk to her. But I just, I didn't have the energy or the strength, either mental or physical to pick up the phone and, and to call her. And I don't know what I would have said if I had anyway. So it was just, um, it was very unsettling. Okay. You talked about those feelings of being overwhelmingly anxious. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that in a little bit more and just, or what the thoughts were, you said you, you were, you were having so many thoughts as you were at the river, just your, your head was spinning. It sounded like with, were they mm -hmm. negative thoughts? Were they? Well, I think mostly I was scared, but, um, also, the thoughts leading up to that would have been, you know, I felt, I felt really alone and lonely. Um, I felt like really nobody understood what I was going through. And also, I felt very isolated. We were living in Alaska, and I was like 2,500 miles away from my family. Um, I kind of felt like I was, I, and I often said this to my husband, I felt like I was um, on a hamster wheel, just, um, just running and doing stuff, but not getting anything done. And, and I, I felt trapped in, in my, just the sense of, hopelessness that it was always going to be this way and felt really helpless to change it because it seemed like everything I, I tried to change. Um, it just, I just kept going back to, um, just feeling really down and, 
and horrible. So Dr. Caldwell mentioned that many people, not just women, but people who are suicidal are often ambivalent. So when you experienced those two episodes, did you feel that ambivalence? Did you feel there were reasons for both maybe taking your life as well as for continuing to live? Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah, so, um, for just want wanting to die was just a, a means to end the suffering that I felt like I was having. Um, just the, all those horrible thoughts and feelings that I was having, but I don't, I mean, my whole dream was to be a stay at home mom and, and to, you know, I, I really desperately wanted to be a happy mom and a happy wife. And, um, and I really felt like um, I would be, well, my reason for, for living basically at that time was for my kids and to, so that they, they would not be devastated by losing their mom when they were so little, that was, for me, that was, that was my reason for being. Okay, so they were your anchor, so to speak, to help you stay grounded to maybe in, in, in not carrying through on your thoughts. For sure. Okay. What do you think contributed to that overwhelming sense of hopelessness that you talked about and that helplessness? Well, I think possibly the primary, the primary reason was I was just exhausted. Um, I was an older mom and my kids were 16 months apart and um, I had a lot of medical issues during that time as well. And, and you know, I'm a very independent, self-sufficient person. And at that point in my life, being independent and self-sufficient was not serving me well. It was really hard for me to ask for help, which is probably what I needed. But um, just the, the lack of sleep um, was a huge contributing factor. Okay. In your, in your history with working with providers, were you ever screened for a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder? No, and as a, you know, I'm a, and I'm a nurse and I had worked obstetrics and during that time, we never talked about postpartum mood or anxiety disorders and we certainly never screened for them. I actually never heard about um, screenings until I took my doula training about um, seven years ago. Okay. Do you think it would have been different for you if somebody had screened you, had sat you down and talked to you about the possibility of experiencing depression or anxiety during this time? I think it, um, I think it probably would have helped me for sure if, especially if they had done it in such a way that um, they made it clear that, you know, they screen for everybody for this and that postpartum depression and anxiety are very common. And um, I think if it, yeah, I think it really would have, made a difference um, for sure. Do you think there was anything else contributing to the fact that you were suffering in silence around this time in your life? Well, yes, um, it's such a, there's such a stigma about mental health and um, 
so that was probably the biggest thing for me. But also, I I grew up on a farm and um, just we're we're strong people and we just um, you know we just push through and get things done and um, but I think also. Um, for me, there was infertility was an issue and our children were, were adopted. And so there was a um, bit of, well, I, I was told that I got my babies the easy way and I will never tell a pregnant person or somebody who is giving birth that that is easy, but it's, um, it's a whole different ball game going through infertility and, um, and, uh, and then adoption. So, um, yeah, it, there was definitely some issue there. And I think a sense of shame also and guilt that I would even have those thoughts. Um, I didn't really want to feel vulnerable because, um, you know, as type A personalities, we are self-sufficient. We can, we can handle it. Um, and embarrassment. I mean, I shouldn't, shouldn't be feeling this way right and especially I think there's this idea that um when you adopt your children you've been waiting for so long that you should be extra happy because you have these babies and um it's just not that way there's there's this kind of conflict between loving your babies and the grief of not being able to bear them yourself and um most people didn't get that ironically um my daughter does get that and i think that's so cool that she does um but it just um Yeah, I, th I just think that those were the main contributing factors. Um, okay. So no one, when you were planning on your adoptions for your children, told you that there was a possibility that you could experience depression at all, that that, was, that could have been something you would, you would have or experience? Not really we did, we were required to attend a, an adoption workshop, which was a weekend long, and they did refer frequently to this idea of um, grieving, um, that it's, it's a loss um, for the child um, because they're losing their birth parents or parents but also a loss for the adoptive parents because of, you know, the infertility issues that I mentioned. But um, so there was a lot of talk about grief, but it, in my mind, at least, it didn't translate to depression um, and anxiety and to um, the, the feelings that I ended up having at a later point. Okay. What do you think would have been most helpful or, or maybe was helpful to you during that time that would have lessened or did lessen your feelings of being overwhelmed or, and hopeless? Well, you know, the standard um, answer when somebody asks you how you're doing is, oh, I'm fine. And I think probably if somebody had um, expanded on that question and been more specific in their questions, like, how are you sleeping? Um, 
are you getting enough sleep or um, just asking things like, um, how are you adjusting to being a stay at home mom now? Or are you, do you miss work? Um, and speaking of missing work, I think that was another contributing factor to where I was. Oh, you know, I really wanted to be a stay at home mom. That was my whole dream, but I didn't realize until I was in it, how much I would miss working with other people and having that adult interaction. So I think if people had been much more specific, also, I think ha having had the mixture of emotions um, validated for me, um, just to that other people understood that, yes, I was very happy to have these children, but I was also, there was all these other emotions going on as well. And, and really those emotion that mixture of emotions is not, um, it's not just adoptive moms that go through that. It, I tell all my, um, all my students and clients that they can expect to feel, you know, joy, but they can feel grief, they can feel anxiety, frustration, you know, um, all those other emotions simultaneously. And it, I think for me, if that had been acknowledged and normalized for me, that would have been a huge help. Okay. So almost like if somebody had really said, so how are you really feeling, Sherry? Right. So, yeah. You stated that you never talked with anybody about this except your healthcare provider. What do you think kept you from talking about that experience? And what compels you to talk about it now? Well, um, again, it's, it's this, the stigma is just, um, and especially, I mean, we're getting better about talking about mental health, but back then it was, this wasn't something to talk about. And, um, for me, there was a sense of shame and embarrassment. I didn't really want to feel vulnerable, but also feeling like, well, I'm a nurse, I should know how to deal with this, um, which is really pretty crazy because um, it can happen to anybody in any, um, any situation in life. So it doesn't matter what your, um, where you're at, it can happen. So for me, um, that kind of kept me from talking about it. And then I kind of never thought about it, you know, for the longest time either. Um, but a couple of, well, it was probably two years, two or three years ago, I saw the, um, Playing Monopoly with God and by Melissa Bangs. I met her at the Lotus and got talking to her afterwards. And then she started emailing me and inviting me to attend her storytelling workshop a, a few months later. And I didn't feel like I had a story to tell. I, I wasn't even thinking about my suicidal ideation at that point, it was kind of buried deep in my memory. And I didn't really feel like I had a story to tell. But two, two years ago, I attended the perinatal mental health conference uh, and uh, attended Mamadi. And one of the performers stories really resonated with me. And I realized that, yes, I I do have a story to tell. And so I did attend the workshop. I didn't share my um, suicidal ideation um, episodes, but shared plenty of other things that were going on at that time. And it really 
was helpful to me to understand the power of telling a story, not only for my own healing, but also to make myself more relatable to other people and to be able to share with them and help them to understand that they are not alone. And, and when a person is willing to be vulnerable, it helps other people to open up and share. And so Dana, when, when you informed the task force that you were planning to um, get this webinar together and what you, or who you hope to have on the, the panel, I got this very compelling urge to, to volunteer and it, it actually terrified me for a few days, the thought of sharing, but I just realized um, if I can at least help one other person, it will be worth being vulnerable. And I really, I suffered in silence and um, I don't want anybody else to have to suffer in silence. So that's why I speak now. Well, Sherry, thank you so much. And we are very grateful that you were willing to share your vulner vulnerability tonight and share your story. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm gonna turn this over now to Kelsey Kyle, RN care manager at St. Peter's Medical Health Group. And I know that she's, sit I think she's sitting with Sherry because of some uh, uh, issues about joining, but um, so I hope she's on, there she is. She's not Sherry Wacker, but she's Kelsey Kyle. So Kelsey, can you um, tell us about your work as a care manager at St. Peter's Medical, at the health group, medical group there? Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Kelsey Kyle, and I have been working at St. Peter's Health Medical Group for the past three years as a nurse care manager. And um, the best way to kind of put a nice little bow on what I do is that I, um, I help people that need extra care and support, um, connect to resources, um, help navigate through the medical system, um, and then especially those that are struggling, um, just help them um, if it's um, with complex medical needs, um, people that are struggling with housing, food insecurity, um, paying bills, um, our team's able to help. Um, people that are having depression, anxiety, or mental illness um, struggles, we're able to help connect them to um, the proper resources. Um, and a big part of my population is working with um, moms, babies, and families, and just wrapping around um, support around um, all of the parents um, that really need the extra um, help and especially if they find themselves um, in a place of struggle. All right, so when a woman comes into your clinic in the perinatal period who is or may be severely depressed, tell us about how you go about your nursing assessment. Yes, yeah, so um, our clinic is using um, validated tools. Um, both the PHQ-9 and the Edinburgh are used in the clinic. And so oftentimes when um, somebody is referred to me, I am available for um, warm handoffs most of the time. And then sometimes I do get messages where I end up calling the patient. Um, but if somebody is really having a hard time, the, um, the staff does the, their best to um, find either myself or one of my team members to see somebody in person. Um, so that um, the depression screen um, is already completed. So it's really a kind of a two, two different paths. So one is if um, the mom has active, has suicidal ideation, has marked um, those last questions on both screens positively, um, then my assessment is much like um, Dr. Caldwell had explained before. Mm -hmm. My next step um, for me is using um, a, um, a Columbia, sorry, my brain. <laughs> um, so the Columbia tool um, just to assess how um, 
how far away those thoughts were. If it's, you know, today, three weeks ago, that time frame, um, assess of somebody um, is, has a plan and, you know, the likelihood of them carrying out that plan. And then depending on that scoring, um, it would be completing a safety plan and having somebody, um, you know, a, a plan that we feel good about somebody going back home um, with support or if they need to seek emergency care and look at hospitalization. Um, so that's, that's one path. The other path is um, having a situation of a mom who has significant depression and or anxiety um, with absent suicidal ideation. So no suicidal ideation present. Um, so approaching that situation is really um, just meeting that mom where she's at. Um, I can be a, you know, kind of a happy, upbeat person, but, you know, trying to like come across in a calm, compassionate manner, um, you know, sit in a way um, where, I, where the mom feels um, that I'm really, you know, listening to her and engaged, you know, I'm also do work on the phone. So just really um, having quiet time to, you know, to call and listen to somebody. Um, and then um, just really a lot of times the, the screening tool is the start of a conversation for me. So I say things like, you know, tell me about more about your worry that you're having um, or, you know, what is your sleep been like lately? So just really trying to um, use some questions to get the mom to open more up about what's going on and just really listen to her story. Um, part of my assessment is listening for things that are strengths in her situation and resources that are already present and support that's already present. And then also listening to where there's some gaps and, um, and then what some options are for those gaps to present after, you know, at a place where she's, um, has told her story and um, talked about what she would like to. Um, I ask about, I directly ask about sleep and how she's managing with disrupted sleep. And I really normalize that that's very hard for anybody to, to go through. It's, it's not like, I think there's kind of, can be, um, sort of society saying, oh, moms can handle this sleep or, you know, pictures of new moms that look refreshed and their makeup's done and, you know, look great. Um, but in reality, sleep deprivation and disrupted sleep is very, very hard. And especially if it goes on for months at a time, it's, it can be difficult to um, continue and just talk about how is she coping with that? Is she, you know, needing extra help and support from family, friends, a partner, um, and what some options are. So some parents that I worked with um, set up schedules where they're able to have like one go to bed a little bit earlier than the other. And then, um, you know, one person do a couple of feeds and then they switch in the night and kind of give each other, you know, good four or five hour blocks of sleep at night. Um, some moms just need extra naps during the day and need that support. Um, and especially if she's had a, a rougher night um, with baby. Um, so just kind of working out um, ta or just talking through, you know, what options could be and what might work for that individual um, person and family. Um, and then I also um, ask about their, her support system and who, you know, who can help, who she feels comfortable asking for help and what, um, what items is she comfortable asking that specific person for help with. So, you know, is she comfortable asking her mom coming to come over in the evening if there's, you know, she needs to sleep or baby's fussy or having a hard time or, you know, a different person, is it better just to like say, please bring me groceries or a meal? Um, so just looking at, you know, what strengths there are um, that way. Um, I ask about um, if she's able to eat meals, regular meals and snacks. And I find 
many women that are really struggling, the last person they're thinking about is themselves. And that can be a challenge. So just working on even, even starting with just small nutritious snacks and asking support people if they're available to help um, prepare those as well. And then I also ask about how feedings are going with babies. And um, this can be um, a source of um, struggle, you know, no matter how you're feeding your baby, but just offering um, resources if they if they do need extra support, um, community lactation resources, if mom's having a difficult time with breastfeeding, um, and then, you know, providing extra support if, you know, formula feeding, tube feedings, different, you know, all different scenarios um, that could possibly be going on if um, she needs extra support with that. Um, and then I'm able to connect our patients to um, community resources. So our home visiting program, um, WIC, um, and those are kind of my, my top two, but we have other, um, some other community resources. And then if um, a mom is um, needing some open to feeling like she needs some therapy, we have therapists that work within our clinic. Um, I also help um, re refer people out to the community. And especially with somebody who's really struggling I will call therapists and see if they have current openings so that I'm not um, giving patients numbers and they're reaching dead ends and when it may have already been um, a difficult thing to make that phone call in the first place. So just trying to um, ensure those things. Um, we have social workers on our team that can help with any um, social determinants of health or instabilities with housing, food, um, transportation, um, if somebody's having a hard time affording medications, we can help with that, um, hard time paying their electric bills, um, or utilities. Um, so just, you know, all those things we can, um, connect and just really, really help out a family. Okay. Sometimes, as you know, Kelsey, a woman who may be suicidal may not be forthcoming or with her thoughts or may not even answer on either the PHQ-9 or the Edinburgh that they're suicidal, but you may feel that or you may be worried about it. How do you go about gaining her trust, um, especially when she may be reluctant to share with you her feelings? Yes, that's a, a very good question, Dina. Um, so I just, I have such a huge heart, caring heart um, lots of compassion and empathy and really just, um, I feel like I have a, you know, I, I have a gift with it, but I just really, you know, really listen to patients, really meet them where they're at. I don't push people, um, but just provide, I guess, just provide an, op you know, welcoming open space that's safe for people to share as much as they're willing to or want to, um, and I find that pretty quickly, uh, many patients will open up and, and tell me a lot of things that are going on. Um, and sometimes with some, it takes you know, more, more than one visit or contact or outreach um, to get more of the story as well. Um, but I've had um, really good success with you know, focusing on asking about sleep, um, especially like, how are you coping? And then really like, you know, connecting with that patient and, you know, validating saying, yeah, it, it would be incredibly hard to do that. Or I can, I um, completely, um, it makes sense that you're really overwhelmed right now with everything that's on your plate. Um, or, you know, just tell me more, a little bit more about your thoughts of worry. And I, um, I am able to get um, patients to open up. Um, I think my most challenging situation in my time of work was I had a family member. So there was a patient that I had called after she delivered and then um, didn't. So then she ended up seeing an OB provider for follow-up and we didn't have contact with her. And when she was four months postpartum, her family member called our clinic saying that 
she had expressed suicidal ideation to the family member and they were really worried about her. Um, so that was a very challenging call, but I just called and said, I'm, you know, with, with the medical group and, you know, her doctor and I'm just reach out to this doctor's patients. And I spoke with you a couple of months ago after you delivered your baby, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing right now. And if there's anything that I can help you with. Um, and her first response was, I'm fine and everything is going okay. And so then I asked her if she was open to completing an Edinburgh screen with me on the phone and she was. And she admitted that she had suicidal ideation within that screen. And then we just talked about, talked through all of the, the different areas that um, she was struggling. And she was really, then really opened up and told me her whole story, which was um, she had a lot, a lot on her plate and able to get her connected with therapy and some help. Um, so, so it is, um, it can be challenging at times, um, but I think, you know, for the most part, just really um, providing that, that space for people to share is important and having a lot of um, compassion and empathy for them. So in hearing Sherry's story, what might you have done to support her through the crisis? What would you have wanted to convey to Sherry to help her with her hopelessness? So first of all, I just want to thank Sherry for sharing because that's an incredibly brave and vulnerable thing to do. Um, and just that I, I know it will help at least one person, hopefully many. Um, but I would have just, you know, really wanted to, I guess, like going back in time in the moment she was really struggling, you know, just really listening to her struggles and those things that, you know, led her to get to the place of having suicidal ideation um, and, you know, helping her find her anchor. She had mentioned her kids were really a huge part of keeping her here um, and help her find the strengths in her situation um, and, you know, the strengths and her support and the resources she had and potentially looking at, you know, what was missing from her resources and what else could be added to help her um, as well. But then just really, you know, validate her story and, um, and just, you know, try to just be with her, <laughs> you know, help, help provide um, hope that way. Yes, it sounds like just the, the power of presence is mm -hmm. really important. Yes. All right, so I'm going to now bring Pam Ponich-Hunthausen, LCPC therapist into our con conversation. Good evening, Pam. Please tell us about your current work as a therapist. Good evening, and thank you so much for inviting me to be um, a part of this panel. I'm really honored to be here with all of you. Um, so I, um, I've been in Helena for a while, um, doing a variety of, of work as a psychotherapist with um, children and families. I currently um, have a small private practice um, where I uh, really specialize in um, trauma and um, parent-child relational issues, attachment, um, parenting, that kind of thing. Um, actually, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting having a small practice and how, you know, different folks will be referred to me from all walks of life. But um, what, I, what I just tend to see coming in the door is um, women, a lot of women, a lot of women with trauma um, and, and some tough histories. Um, I also work full-time for the state of Montana. Um, I work for DPHHS for the Addictive and Mental Disorders Division. I am the Family Behavioral Health Program Manager and Liaison, which basically um, in, in, enables me to do a lot of wonderful things that um, I'm really passionate about um, with, with families um, and children, but more on a, on a state systemic level. 
um, which is really exciting. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your experiences you've had working with women in the perinatal period who were or have been suicidal. So really, really the best answer to that is um, not enough. Okay. All right. Um, you know, my experience um, now in my life um, with, with private practice, um, I, I tend to get women who have potentially gone through that in the perinatal period in their lives, but that was um, historical. It's not necessarily um, current. And hearing a lot about what survivors they've really been and how most often they had no help, um, nor did they reach out. So the more that I hear that piece of women's stories, the more um, it really tells me that we need to, as others have said, um, do a much better job of early screening um, and assessing and, and, um, and, you know, and really offering um, resources and support um, to, these, to these moms and dads because they're not immune. Um, you know, during that during that time of pregnancy and um, a year after, at least. So, along with that, um, I I spent um, ten wonderful years as the clinical director at the Florence Crittenden Home, where Dr. Caldwell now is. And um, you know, it's interesting when you're working with teenagers who have many, many risk factors, teen pregnancy being um, one, but um, generally a lot of trauma, substance abuse, um, potential, you know, child protective service involvement, as Dr. Caldwell said. Um, it's difficult, it was difficult in those days anyway, for me to tease out um, or even necessarily identify if that's what I, I was dealing with. Um, when there was a mood disorder, um, because there's so many factors going on. And it wasn't really until I um, did some good training for myself and my clinical team in, um, in this area that I even really knew that much about it. Um, and at that point, we really um, uh, overlaid uh, maternal mental health um, within that whole program and every single resident um, was screened um, and we really kept an eye on that a lot more. Okay, so maybe we'll segue into that, you know, as we've been talking about risk factors, obviously it, um, I'd like to know about how you see the role of adverse childhood experiences playing in triggering or contributing to suicidal ideation maybe not just in the perinatal period, but obviously in any point in a woman's life as she's a, a parenting a, her children, so. Well, I appreciate you giving me that question, Dana, because um, I, I discovered the world of ACEs um, very early on, way back, some of us might remember when um, I think Intermountain brought doctors and uh, Ann Folletti here to Helena. Um, to talk about the ACEs study. And um, at that point, I got um, incredibly intrigued by the research behind it and um, have really been, um, been one of those uh, therapists that uh, use, um, I, I use the ACEs questionnaire with all of my clients um, because I, it really informs so much knowing um, a, a, a person's trauma history. And you know what we know from the, the research that such amazing, great, robust research um, and um, what's come out of that is that, um, you know, for one thing, many, many of us have had adverse childhood experiences. It's a very common thing um, and really the more of those that you have, the more at risk you are for um, many, many things, uh, many health issues, um, and certainly um, mood disorders, um, major depression, 
suicidality, um, it's, it, it, it definitely um, increases the risk factor, which is why I really use that screener all the time. Um, because again, someone can be in my office and say, I'm fine. And you're going to get that, like, like others have said. And then, you know, I'll just casually say, you know, I kind of want to know some of your history. And, you know, then they'll give me uh, their score of nine <laughs> or 10. And then I know a whole lot more about what's really going on at, at, at underneath that. And as Dr. Caldwell said, I mean, when you have trauma in your, in your history, that leads to a, a lot of different things, including the, you know, difficulty with relationships, difficulty with trust, um, so many other pieces too. So it's just really informative and highly, I just, I, I highly recommend that people don't shy away from that, using that. Um, super important to, I mean, knowledge is power, right? Both for the clinician and for um, a client. And, you know, as we say in the ACEs world, it's, it's not destiny, right? It's adversity. So what do we know now that we know what your score is and what's been, um, you know, what's happened in your life um, and, and how might that inform your potential for um, a perinatal mood disorder, um, a major depression. Okay. And so when you're working maybe with anyone, um, especially women in your practice, because you do work with a lot of women and moms, um, whether or not they're necessarily experiencing a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, but obviously have trauma, what are some of the therapeutic interventions you use? Um, well, I have to say, um, although, although Kelsey is not a therapist, she certainly acts like one. Um, pretty much everything that, that she said nails it, I, I think in terms of the way that I work as well. And it really is about, you know, creating um, a trusting, um, uh, safe holding environment for somebody. And um, that's difficult to do when you've just met them, obviously. Um, as, as a therapist, I have the luxury of you know, hopefully seeing them more than once. Um, but, you know, even initially, it's really just about being, you know, obviously very non judgmental, um, very accepting, very validating. Um, and, and to, to be really real about that. I mean, because, because people know if that's um, genuine for you or if, or if it's not. Um, and I feel very passionately about um, helping women heal from their trauma um, and, and whatever else they have going on with their mental health. And so um, it means a lot to me to really be there and create a holding, a, you know, a safe holding environment for them. And, and they get it, people get it. I also, when I meet their clients, I'll, I'll always say, you know what, this is just, this is you checking me out, me checking you out. It's not always a good fit and it's totally up to you if you want to come back. And I think a lot of times just giving them that power, you know, empowering them like this is, I'd be working for you, you know, so it's totally up, up to you. And, and I'm here for what you need. Um, we'll bring them back. And, and I think help with the trust building as well. Okay. So as you listen to Sherry's story, what were your thoughts and how might you have supported her through, your, through her crisis? Well, I will re reiterate um, also what Kelsey said. Sherry, thank you so much for, for being willing um, to honestly share that story. Um, that's some tough stuff um, to talk about and that vulnerability. Um, so important as a part of your healing. So good for you. Um, you know, I think, I mean, one of the basic things, and I do this a lot with clients, is when they say, you know, I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine, I'll say, how do you really feel, Sherry? <laughs> Just like you said, right, Dana? Um, you know, don't necessarily accept that, right? Like, you're in here for a reason. And the fact that you're here, I always applaud. Like, somehow you got here into, into my office. Um, that shows a lot of strength. Um, and I really applaud you. Um, and, you know, I would really 
want to be um, working with Sherry on gathering supports around her as well. Um, I think it can be obviously such an isolating, um, scary, lonely place to be, especially if you are a, um, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps uh, person um, from Montana and, and also not, not used to relying on others. Um, and um, I, I just think I would stick with her. I would uh, make sure she had good people around her. I would, I would absolutely um, ask her very directly um, because I think it's very, obviously very important to ask directly about suicidal thoughts and ideation and plan. Um, and you know, if, if there were a group available, that would be a major go-to for me um, with clients with, with perinatal um, mood and anxiety disorders because so often they do feel so much shame and guilt and I shouldn't be feeling like this and I've got these babies and all the things that, that Sherry said and that normalization with a community um, that gets it super, super important. Okay, so compassion, presence, non-judgmental approaches. So thank you, Pam. I would like to segue back, um, circle back to Stephanie and Dr. Caldwell very briefly, just for their thoughts, because they didn't hear Sherry's story ahead of time. So um, Stephanie, in listening to Sherry's story, what stands out to you in your research on, suicide, on maternal suicide? Um, I, I'll echo the sentiments. Thank you, Sherry. Um, this, very, very um, brave and also stigma busting, which I think is a really important part of our work that we have ahead of us. Um, I would say that the biggest thing that stands out for me is really, um, Sherry said something about, I wish someone would have asked me um, a more detailed question. And then as we're going through this, folks are talking about screening and really that's what those screeners are. I think Kelsey even used the phrase, um, I use these screens as conversation starters. And so we can have these structured, poignant conversations, um, you know, that does help us to dig deeper, whether we are sitting there as a therapist or um, if you're, you know, WIC provider in the state that is now doing, you know, a PHQ-2. Um, and we have this understanding of what, um, what those questions might be helping us to, you know, check for um, with that education about perinatal mental health. Um, it, it really just emboldens me or, you know, bolsters me in thinking about how we can be more thoughtful about continuing to increase screening in the state and um, yeah, how we can connect folks with the people that they need. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. And Dr. Caldwell, as you listen to Sherry's story, how might you have worked with her during her crisis? What are your well, thoughts? Well, the, the, um, the part of me that's a therapist was thinking about uh, validating her, joining with her, helping her to mobilize her support system. Um, and the, the sort of analytical clinician of part of me was thinking about, you know, what is this? There's a lot of signs of depression, um, staying in bed all weekend, um, a lot of cheerfulness, a lot of insomnia. Um, and I would have followed up on that. You know, how did this, when did this start? And have this ever happened before? And did grandma have this? And, and you know, what can I do about it? <laughs> Okay, so taking a full history yep. of her symptoms. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, I think I wanted to just briefly ask, I know we're, we're getting short on time. Um, did any of the panelists have a question for each other? Is there any question that you wanted to ask each other before we um, go to Q&A from the audience? Okay, I'm not picking up on anybody wanting to I, ask. I wanted to ask Sherry, um, what, was the, what was the most important thing that got you through that and how did you get through it and did you get help? Yes, yeah, so um, I think 
initially what got me through was my overriding um, deep sense of wanting to live and wanting to be a happy mom and wife. But then one thing that, and, and have having, having had a really good relationship with my provider, she was a physician assistant and because of all my medical issues, I had seen her regularly and it wasn't ever a five minute visit. Um, both she and the physician that she worked under, I mean, you could expect to be in um, uh, speaking with them for at least 20 minutes, if not 30. And so I already had a really good relationship with her and she took the time on all those other visits to ask about what, you know, was going on and took the time to be personable and, you know, how the kids and that kind of thing, but also not just to look at the symptoms and um, here's some medication for that, um, but just to kind of dig deeper and, and ask the questions that, and, and not just ask the questions, but also to um, let me take the time I needed to share what, what my experience, my symptoms were. And that day, I was really fortunate to get in to see her that same Monday that I called for an appointment. And she was um, really kind of on the edge wondering if she should admit me or not. But because I didn't have a plan, um, she was willing to just let me go home with, and she switched up my medication. So I think that was one of the main things that got me through was knowing that I could get in to see Christine and she had my back and um, I had her cell phone number and, um, you know, she made me promise to call her, you know, outside of office hours if I needed. And so I really felt supported from her. Okay, thank you. Anyone else of the panel have a question for Sherry or anyone else have a question for each other? Okay, so before we come to the end of our, is there anything else that you can think of that we may have left out that needs to be addressed? Or if you have any final comments or, quest, or, or final thoughts or comments um, before we take Q&A. Okay, so for our participants tonight, um, there is a Q&A um, box and you can um, ask us questions and we will try to respond to them. So I don't know if there's anybody right now who is um, nope, I don't see any questions yet. So I will give it a few minutes. I know we ran over time. <laughs> and so I appreciate everybody's patience with us, especially since this is the first time we ever did this and trying to make sure everybody had a chance to share their thoughts and their experiences. Um, so from Julie, she said, not to everyone, not a question, but Sherry, thank you. And I think we've had several thoughts about um, uh, Sherry's vulnerability, being vulnerable and willing to share her story. So um, from Healthy Mothers, Healthy baby, Babies to all the panelists, thank you so much. This was a really important discussion. Okay. Anybody else, even just thoughts from those who have been listening in, um, if you don't have a question. Um... Oh, I do have a question, here we go. We've got some questions coming in, so I will. Okay, so from, well, somebody just said, this was awesome, thank you for all your stories. Okay, and so Matt Kuntz for Dr. Caldwell, um, can pregnancy help bring on bipolar disorder? So pregnancy doesn't cause bipolar disorder, but um, we think that the hormonal stresses of pregnancy and uh, sleep deprivation and 
stresses in general and medical issues all can act as as um, triggers for a given episode of mania or depression. And so the um, probably in pregnancy, it's the hormonal aspect. And in, in perinatal um, mood disorders, it's probably the probably the um, the insomnia, the the stress, and the hormonal aspects that are the most important triggers for the for the perinatal um, mood episode. And he, and there's also a question specifically about the symptoms. So in perinatal bipolar disorder or pregnancy and maybe a bipolar episode, would you see either pole, both mania and depression or mixed? I, I ha in my career, I've seen postpartum psychosis that represented mania. I saw a woman early in my career who'd had five children and five postpartum psychoses, hospitalized, hospitalized each time. Um, many of you have heard Melissa's story of her postpartum psychosis. Um, and um, I've seen many more depressive episodes um, and the symptoms are the same as any other bipolar depression or major depressive episode. In bipolar disorder, people are often sleeping too much, um, but they're very tired, um, down on themselves, feeling guilty, um, uh, negative self-talk, low energy, nothing's any fun, hopelessness, pessimism. Okay, all right. Are there any other questions or uh, comments that anybody in the audience tonight or anybody else listening in who, um, oh yes. So um, we have a question for Dr. Caldwell. Do you see patients outside of Florence Crittenden? I have a school who works with mothers of infants to 12 years, wondering if you would be a local resource. I, oh, I'm on, still unmuted. Um, at this point, I am retired from the private practice, so I'm not available to take on new patients. But I think she said, also said, she would you be our local resource? I uh, would be a local resource, yes. Okay, all right. I, I'm, I'm always open to questions or, or formal or informal consultation. All right. So, um, yes, so Adrienne, um, you could certainly um, contact Dr. Caldwell through this office. Um, that number is 406-495-1515. And if you have questions about um, mothers of infants to 12 years, any any thing that he could offer as far as a resource he can. So. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So anyone else, any other questions that we can take tonight? I'm not, I'm not seeing any. Um, wait a minute. Um, oh yeah, Sarah McConnell. What is the best advice for living so far away from family? So I think that might be directed to Sherry, maybe because you were living so far away from family. Yeah, it's hard. Um, I think if you can talk to them, FaceTime them, um, for me, I, I had to learn also to make family where I was. Um, I moved a lot um, before I was married and I kind of joked that I, I had a grandma wherever I lived. Um, I, I adopted a lot of grandmas and, and a few moms along the way. So I think if you can you know, find one or two people that become like family, um, that can be very helpful, at least it was for me. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any right now. Um, I wanted to let everybody who is still with us that in the chat box, we have some resources that um, 
Oh, and I have some other things, some other comments. So I will give the comments first and then I will give the resources, but um, Emily Lucas to all panelists and attendees, this was enlightening, thank you so much. Um, from Matt Kuntz to all panelists, thank you for sharing your story and for the information provided. From Christina Fowler to all panelists, what a great panel, thank you all. Um, oh, so there is a question to all the panelists. Um, what is the protocol for follow-up six weeks, one year, and are there follow-up with prenatal after, and are the follow-up with prenatal after birthing? So um, whoever would like to take that question, maybe Stephanie, because I know she knows a lot about the screening protocols and, and um, so. I was gonna toss it to Kelsey. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, if Kelsey can answer that one, I think she's a fabulous. Okay. Living it right now. So go. Let's see. Okay, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I was um, being slow on muting. Um, so um, screening protocols right now. So um, prenatal should be three um, depression screens um, within pregnancy. So one every trimester. And then um, postpartum, um, two weeks postpartum um, and six weeks postpartum are, you know, what's currently practiced most of the time um, with clinics. Um, there is a recommendation to extend that to um, every well child check for the first year of life, um, just because um, a lot of times um, so, you know, there's, there's many times when um, symptoms of depression and anxiety will show up prenatally and will also can also show up at the two and six week mark. Um, but there's also times when those symptoms are delayed down the road. And especially if, um, you know, support, your support is stressed, your sleep is stressed for a long period of time, um, that can just, you know, add more weight down the road. Um, and Stephanie had mentioned with her research too, um, like nine to 12 months postpartum can be a pretty risky time um, for um, suicide and suicidal ideation as well. So um, I really um, think it is important to continue those screens out to a year. Okay, thank you. I hope that answered the question. Um, Anyone else have a question before we, um, I want to share some information we have. Um, just gonna check real quick to see if there's any other questions. No, I do not see any. And so we do have um, in the chat box, um, we have um, a list of uh, resources. Um, we have the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, both in English and Spanish. We have the numbers. And for people who are hearing impaired, we have, there's an online chat, um, suicidepreventiononline.org. We also want to um, let you know that Postpartum Support International has a helpline, both in English and Spanish, and a place to text that. There's a crisis text line as well. There's the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, that we have in the chat box. And if you're not in crisis but need additional support, we have a Montana warm line here in Montana. Um, that we also have Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. We have NAMI. Um, am I missing anything, Stephanie? Because I don't see it. I just see part of it, but not the whole thing. So, yeah, let me throw in the learn more piece, but I um, got some resources um, from the state as well. And so I'll throw in um, those pieces um, on their kind of um, organization for crisis response um, okay. resources that look different across the state. Okay. So um, we have... Oh, we have 2020 Mom. Um, I really encourage people to visit their website. They have a great website, Postpartum Support International, NAMI, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, and then the Crisis Systems Information and Resources from uh, DPHHS. So um, 
Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I know this was a longer evening than maybe we had planned. I wanna thank um, my esteemed panelists and colleagues. And certainly I wanna thank Sherry for really sharing her story tonight and um, being vulnerable with a very difficult story to tell. I also wanna thank Gary Mihalish from um, Helen Anami um, and Tim Lewis for his support in the technical aspects of our webinar. And I really hope that this conversation tonight has helped to bring a greater, greater awareness that maternal suicide needs to be a part of the larger conversation of the public health issue of suicide in this country. Suicide impacts us all and moms are not immune and maternal mental health matters and that suicide is preventable and treatment is effective. So thank you and good night to everyone. And again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Okay, so long. I'll mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you all. Good evening. Yep. Good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>